Is it possibly successful without a digital media plan? You know, the lifeline of all businesses is marketing, right? That is your oxygen. So you have to be marketing. And one thing that I learned early on is there's only two reasons that someone goes out of business, right? And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, I don't care if you're drop shipping, I don't care if you have a podcast or whatever you might be doing. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to solve other problems and you're focused on innovation, right? Doing something a little bit different and making sure that you have your unique spin on it. There's only two reasons that you will go out of business. Number one is no one knows that you're in business, right? Or number two is people forgot that you were in business because you did not stay top of mind. Author, speaker, digital media expert, award-winning real estate agent, Casa Nova Brooks. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, my man. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited. It's going to be a great conversation. I'm sure of it. I think so. Considering the conversation that we had in Clubhouse about a week or two ago, this is going to be bananas. I'm excited to get into it, man. You've done some amazing things, so I'm stoked. Yeah, me as well. Let's get to it. Yeah, I want to start before we get into what you're doing now, because to be honest, I really feel like you're changing the way that real estate agents, attorneys, mortgage brokers, you're changing the way that people show up and stand out online. So I'm re I really want to get into that. But I, I got to talk about your origin story first, because it's it's such a powerful story of overcoming. I just want to read a short excerpt from your website, uh, dreamnation.com, because this was it really was really powerful. I'm just going to read this here. There was a time when my life hit rock bottom. The best year of my life was the worst I've ever lived through. Nothing could be more ironic than that. In just one year, lost your home, lost your job, lost your mother, and nothing was going your way. So because of these issues and challenges that you were going into, you just said, you know what? I'm going all in on real estate. I got, I got to know what was going through your head at this time where everything's going wrong. What made you decide real estate? How did you make that move? Yeah. So I'll be honest. It was my wife. Right. And, and that's huge because for anybody who has a significant other, um, just understand that you have cheerleaders in your corner and, and they're going to back you with no matter what you do. And uh, that was what was big for me. I did just come off of a period. It was I didn't know that this was all going to happen. And I just moved to a brand new city, brand new state here in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, things were going well. I just gotten a new job outside sales. I just got my real estate license and I had just um, put my first house that my wife and I were going to live in that we were buying under contract. Well, at that same time, my mom and grandma called me up and they say, hey, you know what? We want to move down to Omaha to be closer to you, Julie and CJ, uh, because there's nothing left here in Sioux City, Iowa. I'm originally from south side of Chicago, but uh, my mom and grandma made the decision to move me to Sioux City, Iowa when I was uh, 11 years old and drugs, gangs, violence. That was all I was seeing in Chicago. So that's kind of how that came about. So anyway, my mom and grandma calls me up and they say, we want to move down here. And I'm like, Okay, cool. So I talked to my wife and within a couple of weeks, we moved them down here. Well, within 24 hours, my mom winds up going to the hospital here in Omaha. Within one week's time, I lose my mom at that hospital. Now, subsequently, like I said, just because I had just gotten a new outside sales job, because I was working inside sales, so it was outside sales so I could start building up my real estate career because I just got my license like two months prior, but I was doing nothing with it yet. And um, so then I, I lose that job because I lost my mom and my manager says, hey, we need you to go back out to Rochester, New York to finish out your training. And I say, with all due respect, I can't. My grandma, my wife wife, my son, they all need me here. And she's like, I get it, but this is brand new. Like you don't even have a territory. You're in your first 30 days. I got to let you go if you don't. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, just think, think, think. And I'm like, well, I just put this house in the contract. If you would just give me three weeks so I can close on it, I'll be able to then have a place to live, move my grandma in and I'll figure it out. I got this real estate license. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'll figure out how to make something shake. And then she's like, okay, I got you. So I was super grateful. She was really cool. Well, this is post 2008. So anybody remembers this 2008, you know, crash with the real estate market. So what happens is they go to re-verify because I'm supposed to close on this Friday. And two days prior to uh, the underwriters wind up coming back saying, hey, we need more information on your student loans. By the time they get that information, it's the following Monday. So then they go to, to call that outside sales company to verify that I still have a job. And they say, ah, as of Friday, Casanova no longer works here. Oh. So, of course, they don't approve 
approve the loan because I don't have a job. So all within a matter of two and a half, three weeks, I lose my mom, my job, and my home. I got no family, no friends, no church group, brand new city, brand new state. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do now? I got no degree. And I was going to go back and get a W-2 job. And my wife's like, nah, you got this real estate license. You're either going to jump all in and you're going to make something shake or you're going to always be wondering what if. And so I did. I jumped all in. Fast forward within that next nine months, I did 46 deals, $8 million in volume. I got the rookie of the year here in Nebraska. And that's kind of where my journey started to take off from for me. That is an absolutely incredible story. And, and in my experience, nothing is forever. Nothing good is forever because it can be, it's so easy for us to get caught up in when things are going good, you go out and you buy the car, or you go out and you, you buy the, the nice piece of jewelry or, or whatever you want to do. But if there's one thing that's guaranteed is there's going to be suffering. And, and in my experience, that type of thing, when it rains, it pours, it's, it's, it's so difficult to get past that and to have a partner that's got your back. It, it does wonders. Um, it, it absolutely do, does wonders. What would you, would you say that she was the primary driver in you actually making this, this award winning run at real estate? Um, yeah, I think it was, a, a it was my family as a whole, right? I mean, I mean, for me, I grew up without a dad. Uh, I always had that, you know, you got to hustle to eat mentality. And I think the reason being is because my mom just always instilled in me, I could do whatever it is that I wanted to do. Well, my problem was I didn't know anybody or see anyone who was doing anything that I aspired to do. So I always had to kind of figure it out on my own. So in that first year, I think what the biggest driver for me was, was the fact that I mean, I didn't, this wasn't my first stint of adversity, right? When I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma cancer. I was two weeks away from death. I had a port put in my chest, emergency port connected to my jugular vein for anybody who could see it. So I, I've been through a lot of adversity and those are just two of the stories. I, I have some, some ones that I've just had to always come back from. So in this moment, I think the thing that I really thought about was Listen, I still have a son, a two-year-old boy at that time, who was still watching my every move. And yeah. he was watching to see how was I going to respond to this. My grandma, she had lived with my mom for 40 of my mom's 50 years of life, right? And so my, it was not only that she lose her only daughter, but it was like she lost the companion. And so for me, I was like, okay, I got all of these people that's watching me to see, like, look, at the end, at the bottom, when I'm at my rock bottom, you really, and this was something that was said to me one time, and I, I, I really loved it. They said, when you're at rock bottom, you really start to see who's the rock that's at the bottom, right? And so at that time, I was like, man, okay, I have to really respond um, in a way that my son would be proud of me, that my grandma would be proud of me. And from there, it was a lot of fear. It was a lot of anxiety, but it was just every day taking one step of action and having faith that it would all work out. And just like you said, when it rains, it pours. But I always feel that joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for a little bit of pain of ad and adversity. Mm -hmm. And as long as you can weather the storm in the end, you always see the sunshine again. And so those are the little things that I kind of just kept in my mind every single day. And on top of that, I just started building relationships. That was the huge driver for me. It was all about relationships. And who was I building relationships with? Any and everybody who I could, because I didn't know where that lead was coming from. I didn't know who was going to buy or sell a house or who was even going to refer me. But what I did know is that if I had the great, the right energy, if I was surrounding myself with the right people every single day, that there was no way I wouldn't succeed because real estate is a contact sport. Well, I love a lot of the things that you said here, Casanova. And I, one of the things that really strikes me is the way that you were able to handle adversity. I, I was just actually just talking about this on my previous chat, but something that really stuck with me from Tim Ferriss's book, the, the four hour work week was getting comfortable with discomfort, you know, because discomfort is coming. It's coming. It's inevitable. That's the one guarantee we have. So putting yourself in uncomfortable situations early and often, I think is, is an important thing for after hours entrepreneurs. One of the things that you've really high, that I really want to highlight and get into Casanova is your digital media presence. Okay, because you have a, a great, a phenomenal digital media presence. I think over 50,000 Instagram followers, YouTube, thousands of followers, uh, podcast. You're doing all these different things. Clubhouse now we're getting into. I'm going to get, I'm just going to go right for the jugular here. Do you think yeah. it's possible? 
to be a successful person in the real estate professional services industries? Is it possibly successful without a digital media plan? No, I wouldn't say so, because here's what I always say. Uh, there's only two, when you're in real estate of any sort, whether you're an investor, a real estate agent, a broker, it doesn't matter what it is. You have to understand that. And I learned this from a good mentor of mine, Dean Graziosi. And he said, you know, the lifeline of all businesses is marketing, right? That is your oxygen. So you have to be marketing. And one thing that I learned early on is there's only two reasons that someone goes out of business, right? And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, I don't care if you're drop shipping. I don't care if you have a podcast or whatever you might be doing. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to solve other problems and you're focused on innovation, right? Doing something a little bit different and making sure that you have your unique spin on it. There is only two reasons that you will go out of business. Number one is no one knows that you're in business. Right. Or number two is people forgot that you were in business because you did not stay top of mind. And so that was the big thing for me. Like when I first was getting into real estate, fortunately enough for me, I came up in this digital era and we both did. Right. Uh, I was one of the first people I was at the University of Iowa in 05 when Facebook first released. Right. So I had that that uh, college email for anybody who can remember that. And that was how I got on a Facebook platform. And obviously it looked nothing like it does today. But I say that because. I'm very fortunate in that. And any of us who are growing up in this era right now, or we would find ourselves um, saying that we're tech savvy, take advantage of it because so many people, they, they're struggling with that, or maybe they just didn't grow up in it. So it's a huge adaptation for them. And so for me, one of the ways that I was able to grow my brand early on, when you think about real estate, they always say that it's listings to last in this business. You need a listing, right? Because your sign is out there and it's working for you 24 hours a day. Somebody comes home at 2 a.m. in the morning, they see your sign. They're leaving to take their kids to school at 8 a.m. in the morning, they see your sign, right? And then on top of that, you're going to get sign calls from buyers or whoever it might be, right? So everything is about your marketing. You're staying top of mind. So when I first got in, I didn't know anyone here in Omaha. So I was like, well, man, I don't have any listings. I don't know how to call up, you know, for sale by owners or expireds or cancels, all these things that they tell you to do when you first get started. And none of those things were really that comfortable for me. And because what I knew that was comfortable for me was getting in front of people. So what I thought, I was like, okay, well, there's got to be a better way for me to do this. So what I started doing was I got buyers first, which take a lot more time. But the people who did buy with me, what I would do is I would take my sold sign to the closing and they're all happy because they're closing on the house. And then I would have them take a picture with me and my sold sign. So mm -hmm. that was the way. And then from there, I could then take that and uh, market it on Facebook. I could run ads or I could just even boost the post before I knew the difference between boosting and running an actual ad campaign. So all of these things allowed for the community to see me and they were like, listen. And then of course my clients were really happy. So when I would make a post on Facebook, I would tag my clients cause I told them up front and then they would share and they would say, you were phenomenal. And Hey, we did the home ownership thing today. Thank you to Casanova. And then I'm share I'm even uh, boosting those posts, right? And uh, like taking screenshots of it and boosting those. And then the community is like, listen, I don't know who this Casanova kid is, but he's selling everything, right? And yep. then I tried to develop omnipresence before I really even knew what omnipresence was. And what that meant was I was just, I was posting it on, on Instagram. I was sharing it to Facebook and then I was going to LinkedIn. And then when I got a little bit of time, I was going to Twitter and I would just try to share all that stuff stuff just to show that, hey, I knew at the end of the day, people like to do business with people who they perceive is already doing business, right? It's yeah. just, it's the way of how it works. Like it's, it's, it's tough, but you know, when we think about it, when you first start up uh, your pizza shop or whatever you're going to do, right? Back in the day, everybody would have these pizza shoppers, these local restaurants and nobody would support it, right? You expect your friends, your family, they're going to be the first ones lined up at your doors, buying pizzas every day. But the reality of it is that's not what happens, right? And the, the, what what's the frustrating thing about it but it's the truth is your friends and families won't start supporting you until the strangers do 
Mm -hmm. Right. When I first grew my business, I'll be honest, it was not the people who I thought were going to buy houses from me or the people who were helping me. And so the reason why I think that I was able to do it is because the perceived notion was that Castanova was already doing business. Now, of course, I had to still go do the listing presentation. I had to still go do the buyer's presentation. But from there, what I figured out and I got this from uh, Dale, Carne Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I, I learned how to truly build rapport. I learned how to truly um, be more interested than trying to be interesting. And all of those things at the end of the day combined with my story, because we all have a story, we all have the unique ability of why we got into real estate or what makes us different from our competitors. We might say, oh, well, I'm kind of the same. You're not the same. Right. There's something that that's about you of why you got in. There's some connection that you have with that person. It's your job to listen to them more than you talk to them and understand what that connection could be. And from there, it was I feel like 80, 85 percent of the time I was getting any presentation, whether it was a buyer or a seller. And I was using my digital marketing to stay in the game. Well, the, the idea of testimonials is huge, huge. And I, I couldn't agree with you more on the fact that people tend to follow the other buyers. I had a friend of mine who got his real estate license and he calls me the next day, the, literally the day after his real estate license says, hey, you're shopping for a home. Let me help you out. And I'm like, you know, A, you don't really live that close to me. B, you've never, I don't want to be your guinea pig. Like, can you go right. guinea pig with some other people? But if I was seeing him show up day after day, week after week on Facebook with these home closing, so home sold signs, I would be like, okay, it's working. He, you know, I'm seeing that other people are actually using. So that's very, very important. But here's, here's, I think the biggest pushback for, that I get Casanova when I'm talking to people, they, they'll say something like, well, I don't believe in Facebook or, you know, uh, I don't have the time for it. I want to talk about timing and, and time management and, and how you're operating. Cause again, you're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram, you're all over the place, right? How do you, how do you do it? I, I just want to get, I'm just going to leave it wide open. How are you able to manage the family life? How are you able to manage your real estate business? And how are you able to manage doing all this social media marketing at the same time? How, how do you fit it in? Yeah. So I would say there's three things. I think the first one is vision, right? What do I want my life to look like at the end of the day? Because you're going to have a perceived vision, but you also know that you can't lie to yourself. So you have to know what ex what exactly did you want it to look like? I did want to have an omnipresence, but I knew that I didn't want to spend my time doing it. Yeah. So, okay, if you don't want to do it, that means that what? You need to have two things. You need to have systems and you have, need to have leverage, right? And that leverage comes in the form of a team, most likely. So for me, it goes back to the vision. Then the second one was, okay, I needed leverage. I needed to be able to articulate the vision so my team could feel like this was something that they wanted to get behind. Because so wait, everyone loves... I, I got to know. Go so did you build out a social media team day one or is that something that you built up over time? Yeah. So I think in the beginning, um, the first thing I did, to be honest, so I had when I first got started in real estate, I started out with virtual assistants, right? Mm -hmm. Because I just didn't have a lot of money. And uh, and I was a little cheap in the beginning, too. So I started going on Upwork.com, you know, five years ago. And so that helped me a little bit. And so I learned how to navigate that while looking for virtual assistants for my real estate business to help me with transactions and things like that. And then as I started to, to really want to put out more content and, and become a content creator and, and provide I value that way, I knew that I didn't have a lot of time to learn the game of video editing. Now there's yeah. a lot more apps and things like that that make it a little bit easier. But still, if you're trying to stay cutting edge, like you're, you're going to spread yourself too thin. And so what I did was I went to Upwork and the first hire that I made when it came to building out my team was a videographer and not so much somebody local because my guy, he's still with me today. He's out of Argentina. And so he and, and I was I just basically put out a post there and I said, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody to help me create really dope content that was Gary V style at the time um, on Instagram. And I put it out there. I put a couple links of here's what I'm looking for. And then she, and then I just, you know, waited for people. I, of course, invited some people who I thought maybe had a good portfolio or or some good stuff. But my guy, he actually wound up reaching out to me and he was like, hey, man, I can make those. I actually make it kind of similar to another guy. And then he showed me those. And then we just started the connection. So that was the first guy who I built a, a relationship with. And then from there, it kind of 
evolved out and we tried many of different things. He was doing social media writing. He was doing captions um, for the post for me. And then what I learned was that he was kind of burning out too. And so I was like, okay, well, I need to get him back into something that's a little bit more specialized to what he wants to do because he started out just doing the, the video editing and all these other things. So, or, but then he, he evolved into all these other things. Right. So then I was like, okay, well, what's the next thing that I need? I was like, okay, well, I kind of, if I want to get him back to what he loves so he doesn't burn out, I probably need a social media manager. And so from there, I wound up hiring a social media manager. And then uh, 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 on top of that, we started to get into the podcasting world. And then so I always just kind of hired for somebody who I felt could take that off of my plate. And then the whole purpose of what I told them in the beginning of why we was doing it was to impact other people. And so the number one thing we had to do was to stay consistent, right? Because people will continue to show up if you continue to show up for them. So that was the vision from the beginning was we had to stay consistent. Even like Mark, Mark Zuckerberg, I, I heard this from him, but he has that quote that says, you know, we run fast and we break shit. Yeah. Right. And I was like, I've always told my team, like, everything's not going to be perfect and that's okay. But as long as we show up and we're consistent, people know that they can depend on us. And that's how you create something that's bigger than you. And so that's always been the thing. I think if people ask me now, like, do I love what my brand is and things like that? I think we've evolved three or four times. And what that means is I don't necessarily, we've, I don't want to say pivoted, but we've made, you know, shifts yeah. three or four times. Like, oh, let's try out this style of media. Let's, but that's what life is. It's optimization, even from a kid, right? We start out and maybe you're doing basketball. Then you go to soccer and you don't like any of those. And you want to be a YouTuber now, or you want to be a professional gamer, or you want to be an author, or you want to, it's just a whole bunch of shifting, right? Yeah. And you're shifting gears until you find what's comfortable for you. And so that's what I've always tried to do. And it's, it's, it's just like anyone else. I'm human, right? And I see things and I have that little bit of perfectionism where it's like, I don't like that. But then you have to understand that done is better than perfect, right? It's always going to be better than perfect. And so I have to just tell myself like, listen, it's only one post. If you don't like it, you can archive it. But what don't you like about it? And how can we shift and make it better this next time around? So where you get that engagement and also understand that, yes, it's about you and what you like. But at the end of the day, your story is not really about you. Your message is not really about you. It's about impacting someone else's life. And that's how you get that snowball effect. So even if you might not like it, you don't know what the public's going to say. So just relax, calm down, see what type of engagement you get, right? It's always about numbers. Like I said, um, in the beginning, it's contacts, right? So how many people engage you, you might find that while you don't necessarily love it, your tribe does. So keep showing up. So that's kind of something that I've always tried to put into my mind. It's, it's really difficult to predict what people are going to respond to. And I, I, totally agree with you on maybe not necessarily pivoting completely, but reframing your brand, trying different things. It's absolutely vital because the more you produce, the more you learn, the more you listen, the more you learn, and then you need to, to kind of tweak to meet up with them. And I got to be honest, you, you use like three or four quotes that I use almost all the time. Done is better than perfect, <laughs> uh, better than yesterday. Something I say, but that idea of move fast and break stuff, I literally was saying that to my team yesterday because I've, I've recently onboarded three new social media reps to my, to my team. Right. And they're very, they're very trepidatious. They, they don't want to post. Everything's got to be perfect. Mark, can you approve this? Mark, can you approve that? I'm like, listen, just put it out there. Just put it out there. Right. And, and, and that's something that we, we all have struggled with, especially when you already have a, a big brand, right. And you're trying to get your team to move and it's like, yo, just take action. Right. That's yeah. a, that's what something that I definitely admire Gary Vee on. I don't know how he got his team, you know, to, to be able to, to be as creative as they were. Right. Cause I've listened to so many things by Gary and he was like, I'll be honest, like my team puts all of this together. I don't really know how they do it. And I've, and I've showed my team that, but they're always just like you said, like, can you approve this? What do you think of this? And it's like, well, listen, that's the whole reason why I created Dream Nation, too, because I felt like for my brand, it, you know, it was always going to be a struggle for them to be able to know what I would want to do. But for Dream Nation or anybody who's creating a media company, something that's bigger than a personal brand, right, something that really is the voice in the community of the people, I get my team. And what I constantly tell them is, would it inspire you to see something like this, right? Would you get yeah. value from something like this? Because if so, 
somebody else would get value from it too. And so that's that was another huge reason of why I created Dream Nation. But that is a struggle trying to get people to actually take action and just say, hey, it's okay if we make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. But are we going to you know, continue to improve and are we going to continue to take action? And if we do and we're consistent enough, we'll get the results that we want in the end. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's very true as a leader trying to build a team, but also just as individuals trying to grow that presence. I mean, how many times have we typed something out and we're like, all right, I'm about to hit post, but eh, no, you know, I, I want to just think about it a little bit later, but the picture's not perfect. And it, it's it's so easy to let that let that just kind of slide over everything that you're doing. And every before you know it, you haven't actually done anything it's a big problem. I want to go back to something that you'd mentioned earlier, Casanova, and that's the importance of relationships. And that's something I'm putting a huge emphasis on. I've been almost solely focused on systems and team building and all that. But one thing I think that I've, I've kind of failed on over the past several months with my podcast specifically was relationship building. Okay. Because when you get on a call, just like Casanova and I are on right now, there's an immense opportunity to build a relationship with someone. I'd like to hear from you. What opportunities have relations, have the relationships that you've made through podcasting had on your business? How have those relationships impacted your business? Yeah, there's so many to name, um, but I'll tell you one in particular, uh, that was, that was really huge. Um, Oh, actually, man, there's two that really come to mind, but I'm gonna make him. Sh- I'm gonna keep them short and sweet, and I'll just tell you both of these stories. Um, so the first one was I had a guy on my podcast. Um, his name is Dr. Ivan Meissner, and anybody who comes from the corporate world, they might have heard of. They probably heard of the largest like business networking group, which is called BNI, mm-hmm. Business Networking International. It was started in like 1985. Well, my team wound up finding Dr. Ivan Meissner, and he agreed to come on the show, but um, he is the founder of BNI. And so anyway, he comes onto the show. I never met him, never heard of him before, but we build a solid relationship, just really cool guy. Um, and at the end of the show, he asked me, he's like, Casanova, you know, I love your story. I love what you're doing. Uh, keep it up. He was like, I want to ask, like, when you first got into personal development, like, who were the people that really inspired you in entrepreneurship? And I started naming off some people and two of the people I said that were that were really impactful for me was Jack Canfield. He wrote the book, The Success Principles. For anybody who doesn't know that book, he also wrote the book, um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, which has had over 500 million copies sold uh, across the world. And uh, so I said Jack Canfield. And then I said also Michael Gerber. And Michael Gerber wrote the book, The E-Myth. And um, so he just smiles and he's like, Casanova, here's what I want you to do after uh, we get off of this call. He said, I want you to shoot me two separate emails. And uh, both of those are good buddies of mine. There's no promises, but I want to make introductions and maybe you can get them on your show. And I was like, yeah, of course. So right when we got off, I shot him both of those emails just saying, you know, what they both have meant for me along my journey. And uh, within 10 minutes, he responds back and he says, Casanova, great news. They both responded and both would love to come do your show. And I was like, oh, my God. And so that was phenomenal. That was amazing. And um, yeah, they both did come and do the show. And I've built now great relationships with both of them. Uh, I talked to both of them. I would probably say monthly. I try to just keep saying, hey, you know, just wishing you the best of, of luck and hope you're going to have a great month. Just trying to stay top of mind, you know, and, and keep that relationship being nurtured. So that was one that came through the podcast. And then Jack Hanfield, uh, the, what's also amazing is I just finished up uh, my second book. And so I told Jack Hanfield that, you know, my goal is to try to make this one a New York Times bestseller. And she's a big goal of mine. And I was like, I think I could really do it. And he was like, well, here's what I'll tell you. He's, and he gave me some tips on how to find agents and things like that, which was really phenomenal because he's wrote multiple New York Times bestsellers. But he said, here's what I also tell you. He said, um, once you get done with the book, he says, no promises, but send over the manuscript. And uh, if I can, if, if, if I feel like it's something I can get behind, you know, we can talk about me writing the foreword for your next book. And so just huge, wow. huge endorsement, right? Which is just crazy. But again, it came from the power of relationships of serving. I never asked Ivan Meissner for anything, right? I was just having a conversation. I was trying to use my platform to share his story, share his message. And from there, that's what it built out to be. And so, um, yeah, phenomenal conversations that I've had. And then the second one uh, that's been really huge for me, and, and I've developed some really cool friendships out of this, but I have a very good buddy, Chris Harder. And uh, he's got a podcast as well, 
called For the Love of Money. And uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal guy. If you're not already following him, I would definitely encourage you to do that. But anyway, so um, he, I don't remember how we got connected, but we wound up doing podcast swaps. We built just solid relationships off of the podcast swaps. And um, and we still talk to this day. I just talked to him two days ago. But anyway, um, he winds up inviting me out. This was last October. He invites me out to a men's like uh, leadership kind of retreat type thing. And it was an experience. And it was out in Pinehurst, North Carolina. And it was 13 or 14 guys, all high, high level guys, high IQ, everything. And so it was a way that I had to get uncomfortable, which is what you said, right? You have to get uncomfortable, be comfortable with getting uncomfortable. And this was the first time that I ever did an event like this. Cause I've been to conferences, but this one was the first time I've ever paid any type of money like this to go to a three day. I want to say it was three days out in Pinehurst, left my family with a bunch of guys that I didn't even know. There was no, there wasn't a conference of like, Hey, we're going to teach you how to take your business from zero to 10 million in the next six months. Like that wasn't it. It was just the retreat. So for me, I just went out there on faith, but now I have an accountability group every Friday with a good buddy of mine. Um, and I met him at that leadership and and the other relationships that I built from there has just been phenomenal. And so relationships are everything, but uh, those, both of those came from the podcast and there's many other stories as well, but this podcast has been phenomenal for me. Yeah. Well, you clearly have a great understanding on how to do this digital media thing. I have an immense amount of respect for both the challenges that you've overcome, but the challenges that you're going to overcome, because once you have that mentality of trying new things, moving fast and breaking stuff, it's it, it to me, it, if you focus on that and just these small incremental improvements, it just, it's amazing what happens over time. You out talked to Mark Savant three years ago. I would have no, I zero chance. I would have told you where I'd be at today. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. What happens when you start doing that? Awesome. So listen, before I let Casanova go here, we're going to get into some rapid fire. You definitely need to check him out at dream nation dot com dream nation dot com. That's a place to be where you can learn all the tips, tricks, and tactics that Casanova is bringing to the stage. Mm. Lots of links below, too, as well, so you can make sure you don't miss out on anything that Casanova is doing. Also, Clubhouse, definitely want to check him out on Clubhouse where he's crushing it. So, rapid, uh, excuse me, overrated, underrated, Casanova, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's go. Overrated, underrated, YouTube shorts. Underrated. Overrated, underrated, Mastermind groups. Underrated. Why are they so underrated for you? Um, well, it's the power of of the I guess the the compound effect because you can when you when you get into a mastermind group, I think that what starts to happen is it's the power of overflow of knowledge. Like everyone's just the the environment is everyone wants to share. When you get into a group coaching, a lot of the times it's one person leading it, and another person is kind of like half the people are scared to ask a question. They don't know if if it's the right question. Some of the people they're 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 trying to share, but they're really just just trying to have their chest out so it's just it's a lot of different um uh, energies in there but when you get into a mastermind group a lot of the times everybody comes from a place of service is what i found now of course every mastermind group is is different and it depends on who's leading that yeah. and what the environment's like that they're putting on but uh, what i found is the mastermind groups that i've been able to be a part of it's so much encouragement there and i've been very fortunate to just be able to propel my success just by the people that can continue to encourage me every single day. So I say underrated. Love I, I could say a lot of successful people I know will swear by masterminds. I think the biggest challenge is finding the right one with people. You got the right leader. You have the right people that are at about the same level. Um, and they're, and like you said, they're giving and they're not going just to get tips. They're going to, to share. So, okay. Awesome. Uh, overrated, underrated Instagram live. I'm going to say overrated. Overrated, underrated Zoom video calls. Underrated. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. Yeah. Definitely underrated. Uh, final question here. If you had 10 seconds with yourself 10 years ago, what would you tell Casanova? Run fast and break shit. 
Casanova said it. That's what I would say. And and I know, and excuse my language, but again, I take this directly from Mark Zuckerberg. So if you're wondering how a billionaire speaks, like, listen, you, you can find that online. But anyway, um, the reason why I guess I would say um, just run fast is because I think one of the things that was said to me early on in my journey and every single day, I try to tell myself this anytime I have that limiting belief, but it's if you're in your head, you're losing bread. Right. And mm. and yes, you might not be about money or materialistic things or any of those other things. But here's what I'll say. You know, money might can't buy you happiness. But what we all know is poverty can't buy you anything. Right. It can only buy you stress. It can buy you potentially divorce. It can buy you so many things that rob you of your joy in life. And so the more money you have, right, the more that you're able to give, the more that you're able to do, the more that you're able to really find value in serving other people which is what we all want at the end of the day. In the beginning, yeah, we're trying to build our own foundation. We're trying to get ours, but quickly you'll find once you get the, a good amount of money, it doesn't have to be millions. Cause obviously if you can't, ima if you can't manage a hundred thousand, you probably can't manage a hundred million, right? <laughs> so there's, there's all different types of levels to these things, but this is where environment's very important. Who are you taking your information from? Right. And, and so going back to it, when you run really fast, it doesn't allow you to get in your head to where you overthink things and you don't take action. Action. And I think that we all go through it. I don't care who it is. This is the power of having a team because for you, you're like, listen, ah, just like you said earlier, I don't know if I want to post that. But when you get a team out there, if you can get them on the same page and you can get them to run fast and break stuff, they're going to post it and you're not going to have a say in it. And then next thing you know, you're getting DMs about it and they're like, oh my God, man, that message really resonated with you. And you're like, oh, we put up a message. You go look at it. You're like, oh, that was a good message. Hey, thank you. Right. And so that's where you don't allow yourself to really find your your um energy your state uh, in paralysis of analysis so that's why i say run fast and just break stuff i i think that is one of the best piece of advice you give someone because the reality is things are going are moving so quickly if you're not taking action quickly you're gonna get left behind and i do just want to give a quick takeaway for everyone that has a team or is building out a team and you want to make sure that they're that your team is delivering the, like a synonymous message with you i'm loving just posting quick little tips or quick little excerpts on Twitter. And then my team can just go and then they can take my little clips from Twitter and they can kind of repurpose them. I found that to be a pretty efficient way of um, just repurposing and, and keeping a good, good message that my team can mirror from me. So just quick takeaway for all the listeners out there today. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, man, that's a, that's what I would, that's what I would say to anyone for sure. Well, you heard it here first. Don't suffer analysis paralysis. Move fast. Break stuff with the one and only Casanova Brooks. Thank you for being here, my friend. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much for watching. I'm glad you enjoyed this episode. I've got several other episodes right here for you. Smash one of these videos to make sure that you don't miss out on the tips, tools, and tactics of industry experts. Let's take that side hustle full time. Smash one of these links.